Good, a quick, uh, I'll, I'll run morning, through the uh, quorum check. Morning, everybody. Morning. Everybody's smiling after a long one yesterday. Oh, uh, so like I always say, it's like the gift that keeps on giving. Um, Councillor Tierney. Present. Councillor Suds. Here. Councillor, oh, sorry. We have regrets from Councillor Moffat. Councillor Leeper. Councillor Kitts? Here. Councillor Hubley? Hi, Alan. That's one good thing about this. Councillor Judas, I can see. Hello. Councillor Cloutier? Good Bien morning. Bien. Merci. Councillor Brockington? Good morning. Vice Chair Gower? Hello. And I, so we do have quorum. Let's get the show on the road. This is a public meeting to consider the proposed comprehensive official plan and zoning bylaw amendments listed as items one, two, three, four, five, seven, 10, 12, and 13 on today's agenda. For the items just mentioned, <laughs> only those who make oral submissions today or written submissions before the amendments are adopted may appeal the matter to the local planning appeal tribunal. In addition, the applicant may appeal the matter to the local planning appeal tribunal if council does not adopt an amendment within 90 days of receipt of the application for zoning and 120 days for an official plan amendment. To submit written comments on these amendments prior to their consideration by city council on January 27th, please email or call the committee or the councilor coordinator. Any declarations of interest? Seeing no hands. Uh, confirmation of minutes from our meeting on January 14th, 2021, um, report 35. Carried? Carried. Carried. Okay, the first item up is um, a postponement. It's a, sorry, it's a deferral from uh, the last meeting. It is 847 Woodruff Avenue. Um, this, was, oh, this was deferred because um, someone had not been correctly uh, notified, if you, if you will recall. And we do have a speaker on this, so this item is held. Item number two is a zoning bylaw amendment for 300 Mawate private. And we do have speakers on that as well. So we'll hold number two. Number three, we're having a presentation. So that one's going to be held and we have a fair number of speakers. This one is the East Urban Community Phase Three Area Community Design Plan, Secondary Plan, Master Servicing Study, Master Transportation Study, Mud Creek Cumulative Impact Study, Area Parks Plan and Official Plan Amendments. The next item, item number four, is zoning bylaw amendment, Westboro infill study, interim control bylaw area. We're also having a presentation on this and we have speakers. Item number five is a zoning bylaw amendment, 574, 576 Byron Avenue and 411, 415, 419, 423, 425, 427 Raven Hill Avenue. It's in Kitchissippi. Uh, Ward, um, we have only the applicant to speak. Mr. Chown, are you here? Are you in the room? Might be just coming through there. Yeah, because he's um, he is uh, on here a lot, so I know for sure he's is attending. Murray, are you there? Have you, do you see him at all, Melody? Yeah, I'm here. here. Okay, it took me a minute. All right, so we don't have uh, anyone to speak in opposition. Are you? Um, do you still need to speak if we're prepared to carry uh, the zoning bylaw amendment for Byron and Raven Hill? Absolutely not. Thank you very much. Good, thank you. So is this item carried? Carried. Thank carried. you. Item number six is high social impact projects program. Uh, we have no one to speak on this. Is anyone raising their hands? I don't see any. Wait a minute, I've got to put my other, other part of my sh machine on here. No, we're good. So am I receiving this? I don't have all of my, uh, or am I, um, is it a receive or is it a carried? Sorry, Chair, let me just. I don't have my book open, so. I will open mine. I think it's a receive, Madam Chair. That's what, that's what I thought, so. On item, uh -oh, sorry, which item? I, item six is item. to receive. Yeah, receive this report for information. Yes. Is it received? 
Received. 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 Thank you. Item number seven is uh, being going to be held. It's 1705 Carling Avenue. It's a zoning bylaw amendment um, in uh, Councilor Leeper's ward. Again, uh, we've got a bunch of speakers and we'll be holding it. Item number eight is development charge complaint, 500 Preston Street. We do have speakers and we are holding it therefore. Item number nine is application to alter 100 Argyle Avenue, a property designated under part five of the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, it's in Councillor McKinney's uh, ward as was the previous one. Uh, and I see that Councillor McKinney is here. I don't have anyone other than the applicant to speak on the application for the, uh, for the um, designation. I'm sorry, to alter uh, 100 um, Argyle, which is a, a designated um, property under the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, so Miguel, are you there? Miguel Trombley? Yeah, I am. Um, do you need to speak uh, if we're prepared to carry this item? I, I do not know, and, and we're also item number 10, so. Uh, yes, I, I know, so just hang in. So, mm -hmm. Councillor McKenney, do you see any reason to hold this? No? No, Chair, not, not at all, thank you. Thank you, so is this item carried? Carried. 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 So if we were holding it, we would deal with it probably along with item number 10 at the same time, which we have before us. Uh, it's official plan and zoning bylaw amendment for that same address, 100 Argyle Avenue. I don't want to minimize how much work has gone into this one, um, uh, but I, I don't have anyone uh, to speak on this item. Um, Miguel, uh, you don't need to speak. I don't see you here. I think that you were listed for both of them probably. Yes, you are. I see that. So uh, do you need to speak if we don't uh, need to ask any questions? No, Madam Chair. Okay, how about you, Catherine? Councillor McKinney? No, you know what, uh, 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 Chair, if I could just say, uh, this is a significant um, uh, zoning bylaw amendment and uh, everybody worked very hard on this one to get where we're, where we're at today. It, uh, it is going to be really um, good infill um, intensification, uh, you know, the work back and forth, it, it wasn't easy, there was, um, height to consider, there was uh, heritage to consider and how that all had to work together. Um, and, um, and it was one that uh, quite frankly, I wanted to work. Um, and uh, and uh, so I wanna just thank the, the applicant, uh, the community and staff uh, for just continuing to come around till we, till we found, found that sweet spot where uh, this is going to really, um, significantly uh, enhance that, uh, that, that part of Argyle, uh, which is across the street from the museum. So all of that together, I think uh, we're going to see what I think will be a significant um, development in this, uh, on this street. So thank you everyone. And thanks to, uh, thanks to the committee members. Thank you. So uh, does anyone need to speak? No? Okay, so is this item carried? Carried. Right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item, item number 11, uh, which um, we will be holding uh, along with item number 12, and the address is 593 Laurier Avenue West. This is another one of those um, um, projects that has taken a while. I think it was on the agenda when first we uh, started up the Built Heritage Subcommittee, or in the early days of it anyways. So uh, this is another one that uh, um, a lot of work has gone into. So we're gonna hold uh, both of those items. I told you it was gonna be a long day. Item number 13, 191 Norris Street in uh, Councillor Shirelli's uh, ward. Um, we don't have anyone signed up to speak. Does anyone have any reason to uh, ask questions or? Okay, is this item carried? Thank you. There. Okay. Now we'll go back to uh, the beginning, and the beginning is 847 Woodruff Avenue. We're not having a presentation on this item. This is a zoning bylaw amendment, and uh, it's in um, Councillor Kavanaugh's uh, ward. And I see Councillor Kavanaugh's here. 
Um, we have one speaker and we have the applicant. So our speaker is John Archibald. John, are you here? I also will say, uh, you probably noticed we've had, uh, you know, a um, fair amount of uh, written communication as well. Is John here? John is here. He's on the line. He's on phone. Hello. Hello, John. Welcome. How are you? You know what? We're pretty good. We're pretty good. I think most of us are probably pretty tired, but hey, we got another <laughs> very long day before us and you're first up. Good, Welcome. good. You have five minutes, sir, to uh, talk to us. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm a little nervous here, so I'm just going to read off something that I've got written out, okay? Good morning, members of Planning Committee. I would like to thank you all for the opportunity to address my concerns with regards to the stormwater management proposal for this site. My neighbors and I are extremely worried that the infill development will increase the stormwater that accumulates in ponds in our backyard, especially during winter storms. My neighbor and I both have patio doors located at the rear of our homes and are extremely worried about contaminated stormwater from the proposed development, new parking lot, draining off onto our properties and into our homes. I hope you've all had time to read the email that I sent to the committee. It outlines the concerns with the stormwater management plans referred to in the report being considered today. I was going to spend my time this morning defending the claims made in my email. However, on Tuesday, Councillor Kavanaugh and the developers both reached out floating a new grading plan that appears to address some of the concerns that identified in my email. In a telephone conversation with Councillor Kavanaugh and the developers, they are now saying that it is their intention to contain all the stormwater on the site and have it conveyed to a city storm sewer on Woodruff Avenue. The new grading plan that was presented to us appears to address our concerns about stormwater and contaminated drainage being drained off onto our properties. The new proposal is a, has a containment wall that is now being proposed for the perimeter of the site and it shows that all the stormwater is being directed into drains inside the new containment wall. In a discussion with the developers, they assured me that the height of the proposed containment wall will be a minimum of six inches above the parking lot and drains to be installed. When I asked if their parking lot would fill up with six inches of water before any stormwater flowed over the wall, Mr. Sterling said that this would be the case, but he didn't, he was pretty confident that this would not happen. There was also some discussion about a large holding tank that would be also be installed and in to collect additional stormwater. I assume this tank is the large hatched area in the parking lot, but it's not labeled on the plan. Will new grading plans detail this new feature and can someone please explain to me how it works? Should this new stormwater management plan, including the proposed containment wall, be approved and installed properly, it should address most of our concerns with respect to drainage. Now that the developers will be submitting a new plans that will address our drainage concerns, Will a report to planning committee that refers to these new drainage plans be submitted so that members of council can review the plans and be aware of what is being proposed? In a discussion with the developer, it was stated that Ms. Kavanaugh was going to approach the city solicitor to develop a methodology where the developer would be held accountable for their new drainage proposal. Should this not be possible, I would respectively ask that the delegated authority to approve any new stormwater management plans be removed and any approvals be done at the planning committee level. I'd like to know who's responsible to ensure that new grading plans are submitted for approval and that the site will be developed in accordance with these new plans. I'd like to know what kind of enforcement mechanisms would be in place should the developer deviate and not adhere to the terms and conditions of new grading plans approved. The report today also lays out some solutions to our concerns with regards to snow removal, garbage storage, etc. The report states that snow is to be removed from the property and it lays out how garbage is to be stored. I'd like to know who is responsible for ensuring the terms and conditions such as snow removal from the site, fencing, garbage storage locations, etc. that are being approved by planning committee. I'd like to know what enforcement procedures are in place should the developer deviate and not adhere 
to the terms and conditions approved by planning committee. In conclusion, should the new stormwater management plans be approved and the, solution, and the solutions regarding fencing, snow removal, and garbage storage be approved and enforced, it would appear that my concerns have been addressed. I would really like to thank everyone involved to help resolve these issues that have been brought to your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Archibald. I see that, um, hang on a minute because I see that Councillor Kavanaugh has her hand up. Councillor Kavanaugh. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, uh, I appreciate uh, you coming out today, John. Um, I know um, you've, been, you've been talking about this since the summer, since uh, the proposal first came out and um, we had that meeting in your backyard and uh, with the neighbors and um, you were very clear on, on your concerns. Um, so you feel that you're, that these have been satisfied? Well, I really haven't seen a set of approved plans and I just saw that little back end that was shown to me. There's yeah. no uh, elevations on the wall or anything. It's just in a discussion that I had with, uh, with Peter and Mr. Hume there and, and Mr. Sterling that uh, they, would, they would try to address this kind of a thing. But, you yeah. know, talk is cheap. Okay. You know, I'd, uh, like, uh, I'd like to see, you know, something that... Uh, I'm just trying to defend my property here. And, you know, I, I've lived for 30 yeah. years. I know the conditions. And when water keeps coming off of their property, onto our property, and I'm really worried about the contamination from the parking lot of all the salt and the oil yeah. and everything. This is something so we never the, had before. Thanks, Mr. Archibald. I'm gonna ask the chair if I can ask uh, staff these questions. Um, and um, uh, particularly uh, Mr. Mark, because we, we asked if it was possible if we could um, um, include somehow uh, the uh, a guarantee for, for Mr. Archibald and the neighbors that this could, um, that what is being proposed by Mr. Yum and Mr. Sterling is actually going to be followed through. So- Okay, uh, Councillor Kavanaugh, we're not going to ask those questions yet because we have other delegates. Oh, we do. Speak. Okay. All right. Yeah. We, okay, we have, really and, and, and right. I would imagine that they probably will cover some of the questions okay. uh, that were uh, put before us uh, by uh, Mr. Archibald. So I'm going to have them come forward now, um, individually or together. Uh, we have Peter Hume and Jack Sterling. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. You're welcome. Good morning, Chair Harder, members of the committee. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Thank you very much for your time this morning. As uh, Councillor Kavanaugh has indicated and uh, Mr. Archibald indicated, we met on site with Mr. Archibald in July last year to hear his concerns about uh, grading and drainage in the area. And we uh, understood exactly what he was talking about. Um, in the current situation, approximately 65% of our site drains into a old swale in the, that runs through the back of his property and other properties. Uh, and we understood his concern and we committed that we would alleviate his concerns. Since then, we have been working with our engineers and city staff and we finalized a plan uh, last week uh, with our engineers that 97.7% of the water on site will flow directly from our site to the Woodruff system and 2.3% of it will stay in a small hydro bio swale at the back of the property and be evaporated off. None of our water will go to the adjacent neighbor's site. With that, we feel we have accommodated all, and addressed all the concerns the residents have, have raised. Uh, we will obviously continue to be good neighbors and work with them in the future. We have submitted this plan, I believe, to uh, the city for approval as part of our building permit application. Uh, we have explained in the past to the uh, resident how the process works with the city approving the grading plan. We do the works, we have to do an as-built, demonstrate to the staff of the city that we've done exactly what the grading plan shows and it's graded in accordance with that. Contrary to Mr. Archibald's comments, the plan we showed him last uh, earlier this week has all the elevations on it. 
shows the exact elevations of all the grading that we're proposing, including the eight cubic meter uh, storage tank that we're putting in. Uh, so we believe that we have listened to the concerns of the residents, worked with the counselor on this, and come up with a solution that takes 65% of the water draining to his property historically for the last probably decades to now nothing, zero. So we don't know what else we can do to satisfy. Other than that, we are very pleased with the recommendations of staff uh, on the zoning and we're prepared to answer any questions you might have. Anything else, uh, Peter? I'll just say that Jack said 68. It's actually 78% of the site drains to the back and that's Mr. Archibald's problem. And you know we're solving all of it, so. Good. Yeah. So any questions for um, uh, Mr. Sterling or Mr. Hume? No, oh, uh, Councilor Kavanaugh, no? Yeah, uh, I just wanna thank them for, for, uh, for this extra uh, effort in reaching out to the community. Um, it's, it's been a lot of back and forth and uh, um, I think it's appreciated very much. Uh, but uh, so uh, when can I ask staff about um, uh, how now, we can pull this off? As soon as, as, soon as we're, uh, as soon as, uh, yeah, now you've taken your hand down and no one else has put theirs up. So uh, thanks gentlemen, uh, just everybody might as well hang around there for a minute. So we, your questions were to um, Mr. Mark primarily to start off with, correct? And I see him front and center. Go ahead, Councillor Kavanaugh. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so you've heard um, the request and we sent it to you um, the other day to, uh, to find out how we can give assurance to the neighbors that this is not just talk, that there is something um, in uh, the words, uh, something written down to give them assurance that this, this drainage will be carried out. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, as uh, spoken to by the uh, delegation for the applicant, they will be submitting grading plans to the city. Uh, they will be reviewed as part of the part lot control application that I understand will be coming forward as well as a building code uh, to be certain that they, uh, they do what they're supposed to do. Uh, and the city does have a bylaw that requires uh, that drainage on properties be in accordance with approved uh, draining plans. I, I, I'm sure that the applicant will do uh, what it said it's going to do, but if in case there were a problem, then we can use, uh, proceed with enforcement under the bylaw. Councilor Kavanaugh? My question is, is this is over and above what is required by the city. This is, um, um, because we saw the staff report and it, in, and it did not satisfy the community. And that's why there's a concern. This is over and above um, what is normally required um, by the city bylaws. So how do we make that happen? If proceeding on the basis that the applicant is going to deliver the grading along the lines of what Mr. Sterling and Mr. Hume spoke to, that will be the plan that is approved. And once that plan is approved, the city can enforce it under our grading and drainage bylaw. Okay, so because it's based on what they've, what they've sent in rather than what uh, a minimum requirement for a bylaw. Is that right? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, okay so, so they will have that. So um, how do they get copies of it or, or um, officially? Uh, Madam Chair, my, my expectation is that this is a document, the, the grading and drainage plan is a document that we can release uh, without the, um, uh, the uh, first delegation having to uh, uh, do an access to information request. I'm relative, I'm not completely certain, but I'm relatively certain that, that is the case. Uh, if worse came to worse and an access to information request could be done, but I don't think that's going to be required. Okay, I think that's important that they that they uh, they have a copy of it so that they can see what has been submitted and what um, being held to. We'll, we'll okay, uh, the delegation for you, Councillor. Pardon me, okay. Councillor Cavanaugh. We will provide copies of full scale copies of the drainage plans to the residents. Okay, I think that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Um, so, committee members on the zoning bylaw amendment eight forty seven Woodruff Avenue. Is it carried? Carried. Carried. 
All right. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll go on to our next item, which is the um, zoning bylaw amendment 300 Mawate, uh, Mawate Private. Um, we do have a, this is uh, again, it's a busy day for uh, Councillor McKinney. Um, we do have a motion uh, from Vice Chair Gower. It's a technical motion if you just want to uh, introduce it. And then we're going to go to our first speaker, Dr. Peter Stockdale. Vice Chair Gower? Yeah, so yeah, I'll just wait for it to get on the screen. Whereas the report recommends zoning changes to the lands known municipally as 300 Milwaukee private, including an increase of the maximum per permitted height limit to 75.5 meters as shown in document four of the report. And whereas document three of the report amends part 17 of the bylaw to introduce a revised schedule 332 consistent with the recommended zoning details, and whereas through an additional review of the calculation of average grade for the proposed development, the height of the proposed building within area D exceeds 75.5 meters and should read 76.75 meters. And whereas notwithstanding the minor revision in the permitted height, the project as reviewed in the report will remain a 25 story mixed use building with no additional density permitted as a result of the motion if approved. Therefore, be it resolved that the following changes be made to the staff report. Document four of, report, of the report be replaced with the following revised schedule. And the motion includes a map demonstrating the revision. Be it further resolved that there be no further notice pursuant to section 3417 of the Planning Act. Thank you. So our first uh, speaker is uh, our first delegation is Dr. Peter Stockdale. I see you. I see you, sir. You have five minutes. Uh, start whenever you're ready. Thank you for attending today. Your, um, sir, your speak. You have to uh, take your mute button off. There you go. Thank, Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillors, for meeting with us. People of many nations have come to this ancient natural capital to negotiate, commune with Creator at the falls, trade and fish for thousands of years, and we sit at their feet. This all began long, long before Queen Victoria. We're here to consider the fate of one of the sacred islands for all nations that Grandfather William Commander in, presented to us in the beautiful vision of his to this committee in 2010. But the name Miwati private means private. And we keep being told it's a done deal. But it's been a place of public purpose since time immemorial, since the Algonquin offered tobacco and fish at the falls, since the Onondaga called it the chief council fire, since the peacemaker showed Hiawatha the peace tree, which grew into the American Federation and the Canadian Confederation. It was for a public purpose when the Algonquin and Nipissing chiefs were promised land grants for service in 1812, and then their leases were administered on these islands. This building is contrary to the well-established public purpose of the islands entrenched in the 1854 Order and Council, the BNA Act, the Federal Act respecting works on the Ottawa River, and the federal taking back of parts of the island for public purposes in 1860, the 1880s, and in 1926. It was for the common wealth that the sawmills and electric power were created when the fort was built on the Quebec shore where ZB is being built, and when the Canadian Air Force took back the east end of Victoria Island. And it was for a public purpose that the Grever Plan established Chaudière Island as a central park between Ontario and Quebec in 1950. And likewise, when all Jodier and Albert Islands and Victoria were zoned for that purpose in 2008. But that zoning consistency suddenly ceased with the ZB development because it became for the benefit of individuals. This building extends the financial and moral liability of the city and the people of Ottawa. This is the Westminster, Mecca and Wailing Wall of this part of Turtle Island and we are putting condos on it for private benefit. 
The city of Ottawa has sunk the most into the recolonization of this 7,000 year old sacred site. $60 million for unverified decontamination, hundreds of millions in dams and turbines. This is the cute Halloween Indian costume, the red faced, wa red washed face of white supremacy in Ottawa Gatineau today, and we are all complicit. By relying entirely on the Algonquins of Ontario for cover, making them the only requirement for Algonquin consultation in the official plan, the city of Ottawa has no credibility with status Indian communities. This reconciliation is not credible as the council is increasingly finding out. This is true despite driving the nearest substantial Algonquin communities at least 150 kilometers away from their own Mother River Ganges. Despite being paid federal employees, the chiefs and councils are less willing to let us get away with never coming to terms for hundreds of years. And our own sloppiness will cost us. The Chaudier Islands are known for their voids. Some of the developers' boreholes seem to stop after they get to bed bedrock. NCC boreholes were deeper, and one showed a void be below bedrock. We will pay dearly for ignoring Algonquin petitions for over 150 years. Not mm -hmm. dealing with the federal legislation, the underlying federal leases taken from the Algonquin and Nipissing, pretending that the fake deeds with their many conditions are freehold, with half Albert Island not being patented, the tax rolls not matching the zoning addresses, all are so house of cards that will fall driven by our own arrogant belief that we will not be questioned. And if we are, we will get exactly what we want because we've always gotten away with it. When the city approved the ZB concept for the dashing West Side Du Bois, the maximum height was going to be just 15 stories for all of ZB, but that it's not theirs anymore. Jeff is just the face, not the power. You are being asked to approve for Toronto's Dream Corporation, this new American building. Just two more stories to 25 stories, reaching as high as Parliament. And the city agreed to ensure there would be affordable housing here. No 10 story quid pro quo was established, and you know that the other buildings on this island. Thank you, Mr. Stockdale. Thank you. Um, that five minutes has passed now. Um, appreciate you coming out today. Our next speaker is Judith King Matheson, who's the executive director of the OWL Wellness Learning Center. Judith, are you here? She is. Uh, yes, I am. Good morning. Can you Good hear morning. me? Good yes, morning. Yes, we can. Everyone. Loudly and clearly. Thank you very much for uh, inviting uh, the public to have an uh, expression of our concerns today. Uh, I am a wife and a mother and a grandmother and an elder uh, with lived experience in six cultures. And I will be speaking today from the human context and the emotional spiritual pain of not just our Algonquin friends and sisters and brothers, but for many citizens of this Ottawa Gatineau region. Uh, as the executive director of OWL, which stands for Wuchwe Wellness Learning Center, uh, we are a not-for-profit organization that has been working with the grandmothers uh, and a single Muslim mother uh, from many diverse cultures. And as many people will know, I've been walking with the Free the Falls group since the first uh, planning committee took place many years ago concerning these sacred islands. Now, when we look at history, the past and the present is very relevant to the future. And it is very important. And I wanna thank all of you counselors for the hard work you do in listening, trying to listen intently in the year 2021, as the planet goes through not just planetary uh, co cosmic change to climate change, but we're going through a change of a very significant pollution of our environments. And the ecology and the wisdom and the knowledge of the first peoples of all countries is very relevant for the times we're living through. And I know that the hard work that counselors do 
in trying to listen to the needs of paying the bills is very significant to the choice making of these times. But it's important to honor that the perspectives and the knowledge of the indigenous peoples and their relationship with the earth and how they work with nature, not against nature, is very significant to the vision of William Kamanda for not just his people, but for all citizens of Canada and the planet. We are going through significant changes where we must look at history in order to learn. In the present moment of 2021, as a person that has lived in six cultures, I returned to this beautiful watershed in 1986 as a career foreign service wife. And I have lived in developing countries. And one of the things that I've been very concerned about is as I look at the planning committees of Ottawa Gatineau and cities across Canada, I constantly see that because of the crises of playing the bills, every major city is having a challenge. We have a democracy that is not healthy. We have cities trying to pay the bills and pay for all the infrastructure simply on getting taxes from property owners. And that puts city councillors into a bind. It means that you have to find money from somewhere to pay for all the infrastructure. It means we have to have the voices of developers heard more at City Hall than we hear from the citizens. It also means that we live in a democracy where citizens have become very apathetic. I have witnessed the awakening up of people in this watershed, thanks for Free the Falls Group and many other organizations in this city where people are concerned. They're concerned about the environment and other human beings. And we are particularly concerned where we hear the voice of William, of William Commander's granddaughter speaking and pleading to say that her voices are not heard and that they're beginning to feel that they're not real people and they don't count. We can hear their pain. My concern is in hearing a person's pain, can we begin to look at the compassion that we all have in making decisions? When we look at the constant rising up of condos and cement, replacing the green space on these sacred islands that were once an ancient indigenous spiritual meeting place for North American nomadic peoples to come here and give thanks and gratitude for the land of which we are blessed to live. Are we at a time where Ottawa citizens and counselors and this public that are listening to us today can take the time to read the long and the short report of my call to have us understand, have us understand something significant, that if we are going to have a sacred, healthy democracy, we all have to be at the table supporting our counselors, supporting our elected leaders, both at the federal and provincial governments, to begin to understand that democracy will only be as healthy as all of us seek to make it. We need to get together as a society and Ottawa, capital city, national capital region of Canada, needs to have the National Capital Commission begin to actually hear the call of the Algonquin people. As Algonquin said, we keep waiting patiently. Claudette is talking about waiting patiently. They have been waiting patiently for years since I first met William Kamanda in Thank you, uh, Ms. Matheson. Um, we, we went um, way longer. It was very interesting what you were saying. Uh, we uh, were, I could, looking at everyone's faces, I could see that we were listening in rapt attention. I lost track of time. And therefore, my uh, committee coordinator had to remind me. Um, thank you uh, for coming out today. Next up, we have, um, speaking for the applicant, uh, Paul Black. Paul? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I actually think um, I'm here joined today with uh, Ronnie Wiltz from Thea Partners um, and uh, architects for the project, uh, Sean Lawrence and Tomer Diamond. Um, I actually pass it to Rodney, if that's is all right with you, Madam Chair, um, just to provide some background. Yes, I see him on the list here, Rodney Wiltz. Hi, Rodney. You have five uh, minutes. Her, thanks. Thank you for um, uh, the chance to speak very briefly. I'm respectful of the time. 
uh, I commend uh, Ms. Matheson and, and Mr. Stockdale on, on their persistence and passion, that's for sure. Uh, they, have, uh, they have stuck to their guns in terms of their opposition to the project. Um, certainly these issues that they raise have been um, raised at every step. They've been adjudicated at, uh, at the OMB, were further appealed, uh, uh, at least two lawsuits, all summarily dismissed. Um, uh, and uh, with, with comments about our exemplary level of consultation. Um, certainly one of the things that I find really encouraging is that there is more public access to the site and to the falls now than there has been at any time in living uh, history and living memory. Um, and so that's something that's really encouraging and we're, we're really just getting started. We're incredibly proud of our uh, Algonquin collaboration. We have community benefits agreements in place. Uh, we, we have uh, Memangueshi Council, which is an advisory council of Algonquin uh, women and leaders who um, have uh, been advising us in every uh, step of the way. Um, an Algonquin workforce on site, including um, a significant chunk of our remediation team. So these are things that we're, we're all um, uh, quite proud about. Um, I would encourage, um, both Mr. Stockdale and Ms. Matheson to get in touch with me. I'd be really happy to, to chat with them about some of the work we're doing with our zero carbon district energy system and the emerging park system that we're, we're gonna be really happy to see come to life um, this year and in the, in the next couple of years. So uh, in short, we don't believe that there's anything uh, new here that they have raised. Um, these issues have been um, considered and um, uh, we're, we're always, up for, for further dialogue, but um, uh, but there's nothing new here that we think should stand in the way of, of uh, moving forward with this this project. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing anyone with any question. Oh, Councillor uh, Councillor Cloutier. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick comment, Mr. Wiltz. I hope you will never tire of hearing the perspectives of others whose perspective might differ than yours. With respect to this land, I am aware of the um, of of the of, of the past history, but I certainly do appreciate being reminded that there are many voices in in this debate, and um, and uh, it's important that we hear them. And I hope you share that. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I see no further hands up. Um, so on the on the uh, report before us, which is the uh, motion first here. Oh yes, on the motion which we heard, we didn't hear yet. Did we? We did. We did. Yeah, I thought we did. Okay, so on the um, uh, motion that was uh, uh, put forward by um, Vice Chair Gower. To carry? Carried. Carried. And on the um, report, zoning bylaw amendment 300 Mawate private um, as amended, is it carried? Carried. Carried. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Mr. Black and team. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Next up, we have a presentation. It's the East Urban Community Phase 3 area. I'm not going to read all the things it includes but I know that councillors Judas and Kitts have been darn busy with it. Um, and, uh, and it's a very important uh, piece of work. And that's why we're having a presentation today uh, coming from Robin Vandalan and John Lunny. So um, with that, go ahead, gentlemen, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair and fellow councillors. Uh, the uh, presentation is just coming up on screen. I won't go over the entire title. Uh, we went over it a little bit earlier. This has a lot of studies all together. Uh, the Mud Creek study. It also included the uh, the Vanguard uh, the Vanguard Road EA and uh, quite a number of applications that took place during the period. So uh, it's had a long gestation in, uh, history, and we're quite glad to finally bring it for you today. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a location slide, uh, generally uh, showing uh, showing the area. Uh, the next slide, please. Study area uh, resides north of the uh, existing Trails Edge uh, subdivision uh, along Fern Casey and Renault Road. Uh, to the west is uh, Chapel Hill, 
and to the north is the Innis Road corridor. Next slide, please. This is a copy of the uh, demonstration plan. Uh, quite a bit of uh, work went into this uh, went went into this particular plan, and there are certain features that I believe are. Uh, uh, it looks like a conventional, uh, perhaps a series of subdivisions, but what I wanted to emphasize is that we integrated uh, uh, BBSS uh, quite extensively into it. So there's a lot of uh, interconnectivity into the uh, into this. So it's a fully connected offset grid wherever possible. Uh, we've integrated, and you may not be able to see it on here, but there are a number of landowners, so they're all integrated together. It's always also intended to integrate very well with the existing Trails Edge subdivision and the uh, Orleans Village subdivisions. Uh, what we're kind of proud about is that the amount of connectivity that we were able to keep uh, in this, in this, and uh, the chair I think knows as well as anybody else that BBSS are relatively discrete uh, things that happen. But, uh, uh, they're relatively dis discrete things that uh, we do in subdivision planning but they make a big difference to the people that live there. So we're happy about that. Uh, the uh, overall densities are going to be the highest in the orange areas along Frank Bender and Brian Coburn at up to 80 units per hectare. The rest of, these, uh, uh, the, rest of the area will achieve uh, at least a minimum of 34 units per hectare. Uh, we have the, an important natural feature on the north side, the Innes Park Woods, which is owned by the city. Uh, it was very interesting because we had a, a snake hibernacula that was identified early in the process. Uh, the municipal slow, uh, snow disposal facility is uh, along uh, Mariblow Road. And on the east side of uh, Mariblow Road, we've had uh, a couple of applications come forward. Uh, we have the Montfort Health, Health Club and uh, I believe the, uh, the, black sheep, uh, uh, the black sheep lands with uh, the tumblers facility was another uh, uh, application that we had or we, we dealt with during this process. And you can see the uh, Vanguard, the completed Vanguard alignment on this slide. Thanks. Uh, this, uh, I wanted to show this to you just to emphasize the amount of interconnectivity for pedestrian and cycling. This, is, uh, this will be very different or at least very distinct from some other uh, conventional uh, subdivisions that we've done in the past. Uh, there was a lot of a lot of time put into the pedestrian connectivity, so those connections between uh, uh, just foot connections between different neighborhoods. Uh, so the, the neighborhood is set up to be able to allow people to get where they need to go as quickly as possible on foot or on cycle, which is uh, I think would be very helpful. Next, uh, I build out. We'll have about uh, between 4,000 and uh, 5,200 residential units. That'll equate to roughly 9,000 to uh, just under 11,000 residents. Uh, the jobs, uh, because there are employment lands and, uh, and mixed use lands uh, are estimated to be in the 3,300 uh, 3, to 4,700 range. And uh, this is a very long and very, uh, very, uh, a very complicated process that we've been through. And uh, I know that there may be questions on uh, various aspects. And I know that we have a couple of delegations of which we can speak to as well. Thanks. Thanks very much, Robin, appreciate that. Um, and it looks like we do have a question, but um, before we do that, um, we do have a technical amendment that uh, the vice chair is moving. So let's introduce that. And then we will go to uh, Councillor Kitts for questions. Hey, thank you, Melody, um, for putting that up. Whereas the report East Urban Community Phase 3 area, Community Design Plan, Secondary Plan, Master Servicing Study, Master Transportation Study, Mud Creek Cumulative Impact Study, Area Parks Plan and Official Plan Amendment seeks council approval for the adoption of Phase 3 of the East Urban Community. And whereas developers have requested minor modifications to Document 6 of the report since it was published to the public on January 29, 2021. Therefore, be it resolved that planning committee approve that in document six on page 14 of the official plan amendment and secondary plan section 
policy 11 that the following text be deleted. I think we can scroll down and I'll just read the replacement text for this and be replaced by the city will require each owner to demonstrate that it has executed the funding agreement and any applicable cost sharing agreement or the other owner's consent to the owner proceeding in advance of the cost sharing agreement being executed as a condition of approval for all draft plan of subdivision and condominium site plan and severance applications in the secondary plan area, a development condition shall require notification from the administrator of the EUC phase three area landowners group that the owner is party to the relevant agreements and has paid their share of any cost pursuant to the agreements prior to registration. In document six on page 19 of the official plan amendment and secondary plan section 6.0 policy three be deleted. I won't read that paragraph, but I'll read what it's replaced by. Consistent with official plan section 5.3.5 cost sharing agreements, the city will require each owner to demonstrate that it has executed the funding agreement and any applicable cost sharing agreement or the other owner's consent to the owner proceeding in advance of the cost sharing agreement being executed as a condition of approval for all draft plan of subdivision and condominium site plans and severance applications in the secondary plan area. A development condition shall require notification from the administrator of the EUC phase three area landowners group that the owner is party to the relevant agreements and has paid their share of any cost pursuant to the agreements prior to registration. Thank you. Before we um, go to uh, councillors uh, Kitson, Judas for questions of staff, we're going to go to our delegations as is our, uh, as is typical. And we have Heather Buchanan up first. Heather's uh, representing the Bradley Estates Community Organization. And you have a presentation. Good morning, Heather. Good morning. Hello. How are you? Good, thank you for joining us today. Right, so since I only have five minutes, I think we could probably um, get right into the slideshow if possible. I'm not, what you and I talking right now doesn't eat up your time. It's when you start is when it starts. Perfect, thank you so much for giving us time to talk today. Uh, so I'll, I'll begin now if that's possible. Yes, please. Um, so Bradley Estates Community Association represents phases one and two of the East Urban Community. And we'd like to make sure that we are considered as part of the interconnected whole with these phase three plans. Um, while the subdivision itself is enviable for its design and I commend the, uh, the planning of it, we still have concerns and comments that uh, we would like to have considered, particularly the recommendations from the Master Transportation Study, Recommendation 1C. The report says that the transportation study addresses traffic impacts primarily through possible increases to the arterial roadway capacity and connectivity in the Orleans area. Can we go to slide two, please? Um, this is kind of a lofty goal in that we are still waiting for phase one and phase two recommendations made about this to actually occur. It also suggests that Transit lanes on arterials such as Innes Road should be explored to address transportation issues. Um, in that the developments are primarily south of Innes and Coburn, transit priority routes on Innes aren't going to have any benefit whatsoever to the Orleans South residents and would further add gridlock to Innes Road, funneling more cars onto Renault. It also states in the report that uh, residents have expressed concern about increased traffic on Innes Road. Um, we have the public comments from the 2014 open houses and the development concerns only refer to concerns about traffic on Navin, Merbleau and Renault. So essentially what we're seeing is Renault is being ignored in these plans. Next slide, please. Phase three impacts on the traffic are not well addressed in the report at all. It fails to recommend option seven or any of the other options of the, um, Brad, the Brian Coburn extension as a primary solution to address the traffic volume that's going to be generated by all these developments. And you can see that we're looking at 8,200 more homes and vehicles adding to our gridlock. Um, we'd like to um, point out to where the LRT is located relative to our neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Current traffic patterns indicate that the, all the EUC lands so far are so far removed rather from the LRT and from the main highways that 
we are a car centric area by design and certainly not by choice. Commuters put enormous pressure on our local community roads. And this map shows you um, basically that we've got 18,000 um, vehicles using the uh, Renault Road as a cut through the green belt. It crosses Mud Creek three times, something that we would like to obviously rectify as with all city planners. And the option seven route is provided there for you for your reference. Next slide, please. Critical concerns from phase one and two still have not been addressed. We're talking about 13 years um, and we are still looking at um, volumes of traffic and uh, patterns that are, are not, um, uh, not addressed from that time period. Um, I'm actually behind a slide, so I'm gonna go to the next one slide, please. No, sorry, can we go back? I, I messed it up, <laughs> thanks. Next slide. Um, well, too far. Let's go to the uh, slide six. Thank you. Right. Next one. I'm going to give you a little there bit. There you go. Perfect. There you go. <laughs> all right. So basically, we want to point out that um, without a better option, all the vehicles are using these routes. The one highlighted in yellow, the map in the bottom corner shows you that much of the traffic is heading to the Walkley um, employment hub. And we need to make sure that when we're talking about this phase three community that we are planning for the extra volume that's going to be put onto these roads. And to the next slide, please. You can see how ready, how many um, vehicles are using Renault. This is daily. Well, I mean, this is obviously uh, pre-COVID, but this is a daily event, morning and night on, on Renault and is untenable. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you can see that we have total craft, uh, traffic collapse, community collapse when there's any kind of uh, accident, minor snowfall, what have you. Other pictures show Innes Road is equally as backed up. What this means for the communities in phase one and two is that traffic volume has created a gridlock for us. Uh, we have idling vehicles, bumper to bumper traffic, dangerous illegal passing, speeding accidents. We've had fatalities, three of which um, are recent. And the reality is that this is a farm road, even though it's designated a collector, being used, used as an arterial. The phase three uh, study does not at all reflect on any of these aspects. Last slide. Um, in summary, basically, we the report fails to address the phase one and two um, deficiencies. We would like to have that recommended. Other than what is captured in Councillor Kitt's comments, nowhere in the recommendations to the planning committee um, is it recommended that option seven be explored as a primary solution to the traffic concerns. Uh, we ask that the committee members consider these comments and your decisions regarding the phase three area and to amend plans accordingly. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And. Um... Uh, I know that uh, in addition to the comments you talked about from uh, Councillor Kitts, uh, Councillor Dudas and I have had many of the conversation uh, on this really important uh, project. I see that Catherine, Councillor Kitts has got some questions for you and sure. as does Councillor Leeper. Okay. Councillor Kitts. Thank you, Chair Harder. Um, no questions. I just, Heather, I wanted to commend you on that presentation. I'm going to make some some comments um, after all the delegations to that effect, but I think it was very impactful for the committee to, um, you know, see the photos and the maps and get a better understanding of the serious transportation infrastructure concerns we have in this area. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you for an excellent presentation. Thank, thank you, Chair. Much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kitts. Councillor Leeper. Thank you. And Heather, thank you very much for an informative presentation. Um, you were under a, a time limit there, obviously, with the, uh, the five minute presentation. <laughs> I'm wondering if you can go back to your last slide. Um, uh, Melody, can you pull that up? And Heather, I just want to give you a couple more uh, or a chance to uh, discuss this um, with a little bit more time. Uh, option seven, uh, if I understand, what you're seeking is, I guess, some kind of um, uh, improvement to Renault Road in order to make that, um, in order to be able to handle the traffic? That's correct. So that would mean, what, uh, widening it and uh, just giving it more capacity? Uh, no, Renault Road is, um, is designated a collector road. 
It has two 90 degree turns that um, are the site of major accidents weekly. Um, it's a dangerous road. It travels, through, it was originally a farm road and has now become the highway for east-west trans transport. What the recommendations have been and which are um, significantly supported by all four East End councillors, the MP, the MPP, the mayor, is that option seven, which is a route that would continue from the roundabout on Navin, would connect directly to Renault, the, the second uh, 90 degree corner, if you will. And that would also have the, uh, the BRT, the, uh, the bus rapid transit lanes would align with that same route and connect people to Anderson. 75% of the, uh, the vehicles that are using Renault turn left on Anderson Road. Okay. And 50% of the cars using Anderson Road are coming from Innes, from the, the most recent traffic studies done. So the intent is that we understand that Anderson Road and places to the south of Ottawa are the destinations for much of these users. And therefore, option seven, um, it A, minimizes the impact to Mud Creek, it takes out all the crossings. Um, you're talking about Mud Creek studies in your report and the, um, uh, the fact that you have to, we're talking about spending $6.5 million or whatever to, uh, to shore it up and change it. Um, would, some of that would be solved by this alignment in that we would give more of a buffer from the road to the creek area as well. Okay, uh, sorry, Melody, there's a, a, a map. Um... Yeah, um, it's okay. one, more, one more back. Oh no, there it is. Yeah, right there. <laughs> no, there was, sorry, there was a, a map, Melody, um, that showed uh, mm -hmm. not that one. There we go. Okay. okay. Thank you. This is a, yeah, this is the one I'm looking for. Um, and so I take it though that option seven. So sorry, in terms of, of making this the route, I mean, what is required in order to make this this work? So so when if you're looking at this map in front of you, you can see the yellow is the majority of the traffic. That's the route that they take. Okay. Um it's the shortest route. In fact, Brian Colburn sees less traffic which is the road just above um, the yellow highlight. Okay. I don't know, if, the map is not so hot. Um, I did try my best here, but- No, it's good. <laughs> the, um, so Brian Coburn connects at Navin. I'm not sure if you know where that is and I wish I could point to it for you, but- um, No, I think I got it. Okay, and then what the intent is, is to take that road, or extend that directly across to the, the uh, second 90 degree curve curve yep and that takes um all of the um cut through traffic through five communities bradley ridge bradley estates trails edge eastboro um cream all of those communities that would see the traffic move to brian coburn as it was intended and take people to the um to Anderson Road. Eventually, the priority is, as Ms. Duda and Ms. Kitts know and they support, uh, this is going to connect to the, um, the Walkley extension to the 417. Okay. So what has to be done is that route needs to be, we have to convince the NCC, which is digging in their heels, that that route is necessary and a priority for all of the south end of Ottawa, not to mention uh, in discussions with Rainer Bliss um, before, you know, predecessor to Laura and, um, and, and Middick, it was discussed that they could swap the land for this farm road Renault in a uh, replacement for having the road stretch across as per 1999 recommendations, in fact. Okay. So we're, we're talking like, you know, 30 years we've had of, of, this, of development and, and nothing has been done to bolster the road infrastructure. So like the EUC study is for phase three is so enviable. It has all the things that phase one and two don't have. <laughs> and, you know, we're still waiting. I've lived here for almost 14 years and I have to be honest, I back onto Renault Road and um, my quality of life has, has dropped, you know, by 50% in the summer because of the gridlock and because of all the rest of it that comes with it. 
And that, 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 that that's is, just my personal viewpoint, but I mean, you do have all of Navin and all of the South Orleans that are using this road and who express always their frustration about this route. Heather, I, uh, I, I have a good understanding of something <laughs> that I've seen a lot of discussion about thanks to your presentation. Okay. Um, I will leave it there. Okay. Chair, thank you very much. That was thank very you. useful. Thank, thank you. you. Um, last questioner is uh, Councillor Dudas. Hello. Laura? Hello. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Heather, for your presentation. I think, uh, you know, pictures speak a thousand words in this mm -hmm. case. And, yes. you know, I, I've, but myself and, and now Catherine Kitts and Councillor Kitts and Councillor Lulock and Councillor Blade before, we've all been saying for so long that this area has an infrastructure deficit in terms of our transportation system. And I think that that really helped bring that to light. Councillor Leeper, I'm happy to do a, a show and tell with you and bring anybody out who wants to come see this area. And I know I've had the opportunity to bring Chair Harder with me to see this. There's significant pressures on this community. But Heather, I, I wanted to delve a little bit deeper. You, you spoke a lot about some of the bigger pictures, but I think if you could explain a little bit, you spoke about the fact that Navin and Renault are rural roads. And I really want everybody around this table to understand the impact of what 5,200 new households, potentially 10,000 new residents would have on these roads. Can you describe what you mean when you're saying that Navin, Renault, Anderson or rural roads. Can you tell me a little bit about what those roads look like right now? Thank you. Um, yes, in fact, and we do ab absolutely appreciate the support that uh, you, Councillor Kitts, um, and the, all the East End councillors have given to improving the road structure in our end of town. Um, in terms of the, the way the roads look, Innes, uh, sorry, uh, Navin, Renault in particular, they still have not yet been fully urbanized. Uh, that was promised back in phase one that we would have full sidewalks, uh, proper um, waiting places for bus transit uh, stops, that we would have um, that lanes that potentially Mare Blue would be extended, realigned uh, to meet Navin Road in four lanes versus two. Um, and so those two, those things have not yet even happened. And so this is why we're skeptical when it says, oh, well, we're going to improve the road structure. Well, we've been waiting for that forever. Navin Road um, is particularly troublesome. It serves as a major truck route. Um, and as such, you have barreling uh, garbage trucks to go to the waste, uh, waste site and you have snow removal trucks and you have every manner of trucks that use that road traveling 90 kilometers an hour while kids stand next to a, in a ditch basically waiting for a bus. So as a rural road, it's a rural road that's being used as a, an industrial road, let's put it that way. Renault Road, um, it, as soon as um, it enters the green belt is, um, is completely without sidewalks, uh, sharp shoulders, the, deep, the sharp corners, which I indicated are sites of accidents, um, and crosses of absolutely through um, significant wetlands. So we have, I'm not sure what I wanted, where I was going with that, but basically you have um, traffic using all of these roads, um, roads which were not built to handle that traffic um, being uh, used as highways. No, thank you. I appreciate that. I think I, I just have one more quick question. Then one of the pieces that one of the ongoing concerns about development in this area is, is that it has been very piecemeal, that it has lagged in yes. terms of the residential will come in and then we're waiting for the road infrastructure. One of the, I'm, I'm going to have lots of concerns for us, or questions, pardon me, for uh, city staff in respect to some of the larger scale transportation elements of this plan. But one of the pieces that I just wanted to ask you about, Heather, is when Paget was closed uh, prior to me being on council, um, part of the intent and in the plan was to have the extension that is indicated in the in this plan uh, through Fern Casey, Frank Bender, that Belcourt extension done. Can you, I have, a, I have some concerns about the timing of that. Um, I wanted to get an understanding from you what the closure of Paget meant for your community in terms of you being able to access the amenities on Innis Road. Oh, such a good question. So I actually had other maps I wanted to include in my presentation, but given five minutes, I, I 
I, you know, discarded about 20 of them. So <laughs> one of the maps indicated for us to connect to urban areas by foot, for example, um, and I'm in Bradley Estates, it's a 55 minute walk to get to the closest grocery store, which is Sobeys on 10th line. Um, by car, it's another, it can be up to 30 minutes in traffic because you're sitting on Brian Coburn or Renault to get up there. Paget has disconnected, has severed us from accessing the urban um, commercial areas of Innis. South of Innis, there are no commercial amenities whatsoever for any of our phase one and two areas. By uh, cutting off Paget um, at Brian Coburn, uh, we are forced to travel through Chapel Hill North along Orleans Boulevard to access Innis, or we use Renault going through the school zone, two schools on either side, the high school and the elementary school to get to Mer Bleu and from there up. There are no other pathways for us to use our vehicles. By bicycle, we have to use um, partly unfinished roads. So you've got uh, Navin, which isn't finished, Renault, which is not, has no sidewalks uh, for the full length of it, um, to uh, access, again, a, a store like a Sobeys. So we're talking, again, a 20-minute bicycle ride, which is not a practical way of um, accessing, uh, you know, for, for families to do their grocery shopping, let's say, if you're talking about a 15-minute community. We are by far nowhere close to a 15-minute community. And the, and the cutting off of Paget before having this link has put us at great disadvantage. Thank you very much, Heather, for providing that insight. Thank you, Chair, that's the end for me. Thank you, thank you, uh, Heather. Uh, next up, we have uh, Murray Chown and Ryan Fulton. And I just wanted to say that looking at the, the, uh, the um, faces of the people on uh, the planning committee, um, looking at, um, well, I lost the faces, so, but let's see, Councillor, Kitts, Councillor um, Suds, Councillor Dudas, Counts, uh, Vice Chair Gower, um, Councillor Hubley, uh, a, a, a large number of us live this also every day. Um, the strand heard that you hear one of the uh, inner urban councillors throw out every chance he gets was supposed to be completed in 2007. It's going to be finished in 2024 and we finally just started it. So key to all of this is the transportation master plan, which as you all know, has been delayed. But one of the things that uh, the, the chair of transportation and I are razor focused on is priorities, okay? Because in the past, we've always had to go with who is next on the list which is not necessarily what's best for the taxpayer, what's best for the investment. Remembering that, you know, um, all of our, um, our roads, the majority of it uh, are, are paid through development charges. Whereas when we fixed Elgin, every taxpayer in the city paid it. Okay. I mean, that's, that's just the, the way that it is. Uh, Main Street, Main Street, it doesn't serve a very large area. Uh, it's a great benefit, but making it a complete street was, I think it was at least $30 million. The footbridge, we paid for, all of us, $19 million. So anyways, over, I just want to count, um, Chair of Transportation, Tim, to uh, just make a comment because this, because this, this could be a community design plan in any of our suburban communities. We've got to find a way to do it better. Uh, Chair um, Tierney. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, you're quite correct uh, in what you're saying. And I think as we're doing our, uh, you know, safely distance road tours, we're seeing it firsthand. I do want to thank the last presenter. I, I think uh, uh, the councillor for the area is quite correct. Uh, a picture is worth a thousand words and it says it all right there. Uh, what we're dealing with is our fourth uh, level of government in this city, which is the NCC. And there's some difficult negotiations, yeah. uh, different uh, discussions, and it's not unprecedented. We've actually dealt with NCC on land swaps and different things in the past. Uh, the conversations continue. 
uh, but I do feel that there is a level of uh, political work that has to be done to make them see the light. And uh, the commitment is certainly there, especially in the East, uh, but I'm also seeing people's heads shaking, uh, saying, yeah, this, this has been a long standing issue. Uh, we have the solution, it's option seven, and we really need them to uh, pay attention and we'll continue to keep working on that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, so Murray, uh, sorry for the delay, I see you there. Murray, you're here with Ryan Poulton. Thank you, Madam oh, Chair. Julie. And uh, uh, further to discussions or email communications I had with you and Mr. Harwire last evening, I'll try to be brief. Uh, thank you, Melody. If I could go to the next screen, please. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, I represent uh, an owner of lands within the study area for the uh, CDP and secondary plan highlighted by the uh, asterisk on this slide. You'll note that the properties immediately north of the planned bus rapid transit station and the uh, or bus rapid transit route and the station at Mayor Blue Road. Next slide, please. The lands uh, on the current official plan, once again, highlighted with the star, are currently designated urban, <coughs> excuse me, urban employment, uh, which significantly limits the mix and scale of development that would be permitted in close proximity to that BRT station. If I can go to the next slide, please. We raised those concerns uh, with staff at the time of the adoption of Official Plan Amendment 180. An appeal was filed uh, with respect to Official Plan 180 on behalf of our clients. That appeal was withdrawn uh, once we received a written commitment from uh, Mr. Smith on behalf of the city indicating, and I'll read this out, specific to the lands under appeal, we understand your client's need for supportive Residential, we acknowledge the proximity of the lands under appeal to the planned BRT station at Mare Bleu. We confirm the city's desire to develop a mix of uses at relatively higher densities in close proximity to BRT stations. The city pledges to work with your client on these issues in 2019 and beyond, and with your client acknowledging that staff cannot make commitments on behalf of council. If I can go to the next slide, please. Madam Chair, members of the committee, this is um, a schedule from the draft official plan that was released in November. Uh, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but the asterisk here uh, highlights that this property is uh, proposed to be uh, designated as a hub in the new official plan, which would allow for a, a mix of uses at a higher density than the current designation. The frontage of the property on Maribel Road, Maribel is identified as a minor corridor, which would also permit a mix of uses at a higher density than the current designation in the official plan. If I can go to the next slide, please. So this is the same figure that uh, staff had presented to you in their presentation. You can see that these lands are proposed to be designated employment in the secondary plan. And so our concern is quite simple that uh, policies and designations in a secondary plan always trump the policies and designations in the parent official plan. So the approval of this secondary plan uh, designating these lands employment could have the effect following adoption of the new official plan that despite the proposals in the draft official plan to allow for a mix of uses at a higher density that in fact development of these lands would be limited by the policies of the secondary plan that only allow for employment uses at a reduced scale on these lands. Uh, we've raised these concerns in uh, submissions that were delivered to staff uh, yesterday and to members of committee yesterday as I say, in communications with the chair and uh, Mr. Herwire, uh, Mr. Herwire is committed to give uh, us an assurance that uh, assuming that the proposal for these lands to be designated as a hub and minor corridor carry forward with the new official plan when it comes back to council in the fall, uh, 
um, that they at the same time they will amend this plan uh, to remove uh, the these lands from this plan so that the designation and policies of the new official plan would be full force in effect. I had initially requested that these lands simply be removed from the secondary plan to avoid the issue entirely, uh, but I have some comfort uh, from the communications with the chair and Mr. Herwire that we can address our concerns without amending the secondary plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chown. Um, Councillor Leeper has a question. And um, <coughs> before you do, Robin and jo Robin, uh, just be prepared to make a comment on, uh, on uh, I mean, it probably would be easier if we just had that happen now, but because we have a routine that we follow, I'd like you to comment on it. Are you aware of it or, or is it, or John, Don, you're there. Okay, you're there. Okay, good. So just uh, take note if you could speak to that. Okay, um, Councilor Leeper. Yeah, uh, so I, I don't understand why we would pass the secondary plan today with the designation that we fully intend on changing in the official plan. Why not change the designation today? Murray, can you give me some insight as to why you're not pressing for that amendment um, coming out of planning committee or at council? So uh, this is a matter that we've discussed with the consultant team uh, previously on this, on the secondary plan. It didn't resonate well with either the consultants or staff at the time. I, they can speak for themselves in terms of why they weren't comfortable with designating this property for mixed use as part of the secondary plan. Um, you know, they, they've chosen not to do that. That's not what before you before you today. I could have pushed for that, but the, the, the simpler solution, I think, is to hope that moving forward, the new official plan will fix this problem. Okay, I'll be, uh, I, I see Councillor Dudas has got her hand up, so I'll uh, uh, listen to those comments. But it does seem odd that if you have uh, direction from staff that they will change the designation once the OP designation changes and this becomes a hub, uh, that we wouldn't simply do that today. Okay, thank you for your question. Going now to Councillor Dudas. Councillor Dudas, questions for Mr. Chan. Yes, thank you. And I, I think probably these will end up falling into Robin or Dawn's lap in terms of answering. But uh, Marie, I, I guess just for clarification, I have the same question. So this is a this is a, a landowners led uh, report that city staff has been feeding into. It's been coming for years for years and years and years. There was a lot of delays, a lot of back and forth in regards to coming to a plan on this. Um, every version I've ever seen in the last two years has included this land in this designation. So why now are you bringing this up? Why wasn't this, I know you just tried to explain it to Councillor Lieber, but I'm still failing to understand why this isn't something you would have addressed at an earlier stage. And I also have concerns too in that, you know, in the East End, we're constantly building houses. We, we lack the employment that we need. We lack the certain designations to see anything except for a, a residential or a big box store in South Orleans. So I'm trying to wrap my head around how uh, waiting would make sense for you um, and what it ultimately means to see this change. So to be clear, this is not the first time we've raised it. I think that the consultant team and staff will acknowledge that we've raised this earlier in the uh, discussions about the secondary plan and uh, the CDP. Um, we were frustrated in terms of those submissions to the consultant team and staff at the time. To be honest, I didn't even know this report was coming forward until the agenda was released last week and only then did we react to it uh, in a formal way but our position has been clear for years with respect to our preference for these lands to be identified for a mix of uses at a higher density than what's, uh, what the employment area designation permits. That our, that's on the record. Uh, we're at a point now where you know, we could continue to push aggressively 
to to get the fix today. That would be marvelous if we could. But we recognize that the draft official plan isn't very far away with any luck, you know, with all your efforts yesterday at council, with any luck, we'll have a, a new council adopted official plan in September, which will finally address our concerns. Okay. I'll look to, to um, city staff to, to provide their feedback on that. Thank you, Murray. Thank you. Thank you, Murray. That's it for uh, this item for you. I'll be um, back. Oh, I know, like a bad penny. <laughs> as the very old saying goes. Um, so next up we have the, um, the applicant speaking, and are these all applicants? No, I didn't think so. Okay. No, the applicant's us. Anyway, okay, so the first person, these are the people I have left. So I'm sure that you've organized, I see Julie already has her, her uh, video on, so. Maybe that you can uh, help me out, but we have Baruz Wahab uh, from Richcraft, Julie Carrera from Foten, Laura Maxell, Arthur Gordon, Kelly Roberts, that's it for registered speakers. Are you all speaking or are you here for questions? Do you know, Julie, do you know any of these people? Like, are you in the, in regard to this item? Yeah, this is a developer initiated CDP and that's the consulting team, transportation okay. consultant, civil engineering consultant, environmental assessment consultant, and Froze is representing Richcraft, which is the primary landowner. So we're here to answer any questions you may have. Okay, so you're not doing your presentation? No. Okay, so we might actually have some questions then. Um, so who we have here, uh, I, I read it out, but I will tell you, uh, who the people are, anyone who would like to ask questions um, of the um, of those who were involved with the uh, developer-led uh, CDP, um, put your hands up while I'm just announcing them again. Farooz Wah Farooz Wahab, Julie Carrera, Laura Maxwell, Arthur Gordon, Kelly Roberts, and their environmental planners. Kelly Roberts is environmental planner at Morrison Hirschfield. Uh, Arthur Gordon is principal, Castle Glen Consultants, that's on transportation. Laura Maxwell, client manager, David Sha Schaefer, engineering. Julie is with Fogtan, and you already know that Farouz is Ridgecraft. Um, Laura, you have questions of any of these people? So Councillor Dudas uh, is up. Thank you. Wonderful. I just have one quick question because I have most of my questions for staff. Um, one of the uh, one of the items that was mentioned in this report is the establishment of a landowners group in terms of uh, working out the cost sharing aspects of this. Uh, as uh, the chair just read out, there's multiple players at this table. There's multiple uh, people working on projects. We also have Glenview right next to it, and then Kaivan, which is also. Uh, just a little bit adjacent as well. So we have a myriad of, uh, of groups that are invested in this land. My question is, and I'm not quite sure who would be better to answer it, is it's wonderful that the group, the landowners group, will be working out who's spending money on which and how they're going to be uh, coming up with the money and when. How will you be working together to ensure that there is a cohesive plan um, in terms of the integration of construction, the integration of the street networks as based on what this plan entails, um, how residents will see parks established at the time that they're supposed to be done. I would just like to understand how better you're going to collaborate on this so we don't see it done in a piecemeal approach. Sure, Froze, did you want to, I can go over maybe just a brief overview of the, that there are various agreements that uh, will be created and then maybe um, Froze could go over the more specifics uh, from a de developer perspective. Uh, but there is, there's an agreement for all of the landowners in the entire CDP area, which uh, you mentioned Kai Ben, but they're just outside our CDP area. Uh, and then there are other agreements such as the Parkland uh, dedication agreement, and then there'll be other separate agreements where there are two or more developers who are sharing infrastructure. Uh, so they would have their own individual agreement. So it is um, 
There's a lot going on. There will be administ an administrator of the landowners group uh, who I assume would assist a lawyer. Um, Froze, do you have anything to add on the actual implementation? Because at, at this point, if you look in, there's a section in the CDP that describes all these agreements and in the secondary plan, um, but we haven't actually got to the stage um, of implementing these. So I think through each of the plans of subdivision, as an example, the area parks plan, each of the developers, the way the, the demonstration plan hopefully will actually be ultimately the plan of subdivision. So within each of the development communities, your parkland dedication should sort of be what you're required to give. And through your plans of subdivision, you would develop those. So it wouldn't be done in a piecemeal sense. It's actually been thought up quite a bit through just the, through the development of the demonstration plan. Now there may be some trading at some point in time down the road as you kind of tweak and refine. But I think ultimately what you see on that demonstration plan is, is going to be what gets built. And as Julie had sort of said, um, for the most part, there won't be tons of cost sharing because Richcraft owns a majority of the land and there's a little bit that Glenview will. And so any sort of infrastructure of someone draining through someone else's property or having to connect through, there'll be private landowner agreements that will be done to ensure that's done. It's the, you know, you pay when you connect, connect sort of thing. Um, in terms of how the development is going to move, it'll likely move from west to east because that's where the storm pond is, that's where all the outlets are, and so that's how you will see the piece to the north develop. Okay. And just one more quick question, Bruce, you might be the best then to answer this as the primary landowner. Um, in terms of the timeline, we're looking at uh, 5,200 roughly residential units. Mm -hmm. In the report, it states that that's going to happen somewhere before 2036. Is that an accurate timeline? I know that in past discussions with staff, they've said that it could be a little bit further out. Could you, is that what we're looking at in terms of the, uh, the presumed date for completion? Yeah, well, so my current estimate is 2041 <laughs> when I look at my current timeline right now. But that's sort of a bit of a moving target. It's a function, obviously, of sales in the area. It's a function of a lot of things. Which crop is typically a better, you know, a, in an area like this, per build maybe 70 units a year. Um, and we do have a lot of land. So I don't want to be held to a timeline specifically, but we typically are sort of one of the, the smaller, larger track home builders in the area. So we wouldn't be as aggressive as, say, the Kaiban or Glenview. Um, so it'll kind of develop over time. And as you're aware, we have quite a bit of land already in. Trails Edge phases two and three, and we have a subsequent phase south of the Hydro Corridor. So I don't know when specifically we're going to be going north, but we do have a, quite a bit to the south. Can I ask you who whoever sure. has their their um their audio on? We can hear a lot of background. If you could just turn it off, I think it might be one of the people, uh, one of the consultants. Anything else? Um, any other questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Gower has a question. Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I introduced a technical amendment at the start of this item and it was um, prepared by staff, but I believe it was at the request of the applicant. I was just wondering if you could briefly explain what those uh, tweaks to the text around funding and cost sharing actually means and why it's required. Robin was the one who um, was uh, making those tweaks. So I'm not sure if he could speak to the final uh, text that came forward. Actually, um, I was I was tangled up with the growth management strategy yesterday. So I'm going to defer to uh, John Lunny, who was a little more active on the file yesterday. Not sure. Um, with respect to the motion, the intention was just to clarify for area landowners that um, private cost sharing agreements will be a condition of future planning approvals. Um, the former wording was erroneous and it suggested um, these agreements would be a condition of the plan of subdivision, which is later in the process. So it's just for, for clarity and process sake. Okay, thank you for clarifying for the committee. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. I think this is... All right, I don't see any any other questions for you, but uh, just in case there's a need, um, don't go too far, okay? Because now we're gonna go back to questions of, uh, of staff. I see a whole bunch of staff that are here. 
Um, I, I have a I have a question of my own before we uh, uh, get into it, and it's for Mr. Herwire. Are you there, Don? Oh, yes. there you are. So I'm just wondering why staff didn't make the change for Murray, uh, Mr. Chown. I'm. Is there a reason? Yeah. Yes, Madam Chair. There is a reason. It's it's really a a chicken and egg thing in terms of. Uh, changing the employment designation at this time. Uh, it needs to be done through the, uh, the OP process, a comprehensive review. Uh, certainly, I think we're all aligned in terms of the directions uh, we're heading uh, with the new OP, but it's, um, it's, it's that issue that that change can only happen through the larger OP process, not the secondary plan. So really we're a good month away a good year away from the final of that. I mean, I imagine it has to wait until after it goes uh, to the province and sometime next February, it comes back. I mean, we'll be doing our part in September at a joint committee and a council in September. And I mean, that doesn't sound far away. Um, what kind of impact in not doing this in this time frame? what is the impact to, uh, to what, uh, you know, what investment looks like. I think you've summarized the timing uh, well, Madam Chair, in terms of uh, the impact. Um, I, I believe in discussions with uh, Mr. Chown yesterday, um, they acknowledge the issue. And uh, I think that would be a better question for the landowner to respond to, but they seem, um, they seem content with the approach. Which is why I asked if, if you don't mind everybody, I'm just gonna ask the landowner, I guess is Farouz. Representing Richcraft, is that who's the who would speak to that for us? No, not you're not that landowner. You're, the Murray Chown is the one speaking to the other landowner. Okay, all right. Um, I think we're getting muddier and muddier. Uh, Councillor Kitts and then Councillor Dudas. Questions of staff. Thank you, Chair. I have a, a couple comments and then I, I do have a couple questions. Um, I'll be honest, I don't think what I'm about to say will illustrate as well as Heather Buchanan's presentation did about the transportation issues at play in this area. Um, but I'm really grateful that you all had the opportunity to see those photos and get a better visual for what myself and Councillor Dudas, our East End colleagues, uh, and all those who have come before us have been talking about when it comes to transportation infrastructure in South Orleans. Um, so if you look at a map of the entire East End, the area we're discussing today is a large swath of undeveloped land within the current urban boundary. So I think we have a unique opportunity here to take a step in the right direction and show how we want greenfield development to come together in our growing city. Councillor Dudas and I had an opportunity pr to provide comments on the CDP and I think it's important to share some of the comments that I provided because this is a drum I will continue to bang on uh, whenever we are discussing adding more development to this area. So the, the East Urban Community Phase 3 Area CDP is a statement of best intentions as it concerns progressive transportation principles, but it makes little mention of the broader transportation context south of Innes Road. Not considering how this new community fits within the TMP affordable network and the Brian Coburn extension will only add 5,000 or more car dependent households in an area where the road network is already at capacity. The bus rapid transit network expected to feed the LRT system from East End Community south of Innes Road is planned to run alongside the Brian Coburn extension to Blair Road. This long awaited extension is currently stalled by a breakdown of negotiations between the city and the NCC for the use of NCC lands between Chapel Hill South and Blair Road. In this context, the best laid active transportation and transit plans will only feed cyclists and transit users into a network of inadequate former rural roads just outside of the CDP area. The situation will inevitably add more cars to the road, create more congestion, I mean, walking, walking, cycling, and transit conditions even more untenable. So as we adopt this CDP, which I think, as I said, is, is you know, um, a good plan, I need to make it clear that upgrades to our transportation and transit network in this area must be a priority if we want to see 
this plan succeed? So question to staff, can you yeah, illuminate Councilor what- Kitts, Councilor Kitts, just in, in, the, in the future, the question should come first. Okay, <laughs> and then, then the wrap up, because that's pretty much your wrap up, I think, wasn't it? Well, I mean, it's a statement I have okay. to make. I'm still learning, but I appreciate that. Yeah, I know. I'll reverse that's it next why, time. <laughs> that, that's why, because as you notice with the questions, usually there's like a lot of other questions and then everybody else will start talking about, but it was a great wrap up and go ahead with your questions. Okay. Apologies. No, so, no, no problem. What, my question to staff, what is the status of negotiations with the NCC? Have there been any new efforts made with respect to the land swap Councillor Turney just mentioned? Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. I'll, uh, I'll start with that. I certainly um, received an update from our transportation colleagues who couldn't join us uh, today. Um, and I know, I think uh, certainly Councillor Gudas and Kitts are, are uh, very familiar with this issue. Uh, just for the benefit of the, the rest of the committee. Um, and it's also come up in the urban expansion discussions for lands uh, further to the east. So in terms of, um, maybe I'll just give a, a brief picture on the uh, transportation path plan timing and then focusing on Brian Coburn and Cumberland Transit EA timing. So as everyone knows, the TMP is, uh, is underway. Um, it's, it's scheduled to be completed in the fall of 2023. Um, certainly through that process, projects will be, you know, prioritized by staff using a, a framework um, and that, that will uh, also have an affordable uh, lens in terms of long range financial plan. So that will come to, uh, to committee and council, you know, in that time frame. So I expect there'll be a lot of uh, discussions in terms of priorities and projects for sure. In terms of the Brian Covert Extension EA, um, the discussions I, I think aware are ongoing. The uh, final consultations are scheduled to happen in Q2 of this year. And then the plan is to bring a recommended plan forward by the end of 2021. Uh, that would come to the Transportation Committee for uh, discussion. So um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Robin if there's anything he wants to highlight. And I would also note that um, Arthur Gordon, the Transportation Consultant, is uh, is uh, on the call if there's any more specific questions. Yeah, yes, uh, thank you, Don. Uh, I think we'd heard throughout the process, I've been involved with the project since 2016, uh, traffic and uh, congestion were one of the pr uh, primary uh, primary things that we heard throughout it. One of the one of the things that Ms. Buchanan mentioned was connectivity to, to Innes Road. Uh, it, it is discussed in the report, The uh, with the closure of uh, Paget Road, um, uh, some of the relief valve for uh, folks to get up to the to the shopping district was not there, and it became uh, more pronounced that there, uh, uh, Frank Bender and Fern Casey needed to be extended and, and made there. Uh, the reasoning is that uh, actually uh, Brian Coburn and Mayor Blow are the arterial roads, and that's where that's intended to take most of the traffic. Now, when we deal with the broader network. Uh, there, we did actually spend a, a very long time looking at the overall traffic network. There was a lot of uh, transit priority measures that we discussed. We, we got into discussions with OC Transpo relating to the, LR, the forthcoming LRT. The LRT in Orleans will be there in, to, in 2024, which will mean uh, desire lines for uh, folks getting to uh, the downtown business district will be north to the LRT, hopefully on on buses and then, and then downtown rather than uh, rather than by automobile. Um, what I would like to do as well is I'd like to bring Arthur Gordon online. Arthur uh, has quite a bit of history within the city and in the East End. Uh, we'd asked Arthur to look uh, very carefully at not only transit measures and transit priority measures, but the overall transit network to understand where those uh, where those congest uh, where the points of congestion are. I think. And if you'll, Madam Chair, if you'll, if you'll uh, give us a few minutes, I'd like to have Arthur Gordon speak uh, a little bit about the overall transit network there. Sure, going to that right there is Arthur Gordon's right there. Go ahead, sir. Hello. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate Councillor Kitts and Councillor Dudas in, in uh, addressing issues 
that go back to the late 80s when I was involved in the region of Ottawa Carleton. Uh, the East Urban community has suffered from a deficit of infrastructure, as you referred to it, Councillor Dudas, for many decades. And as it continues to grow, yes, infrastructure has been added, but not at a rate that would satisfy the concerns of residents and the infrastructure has taken place and it will continue to take place. Um, one of the comments was that this study did not look at the overall regional perspective. Uh, let me assure you that staff, the consulting group, uh, as, as well as everyone involved in the project are very aware of what this community, how it integrates with the overall regional fabric. Uh, modeling was undertaken, uh, intersection capacity analysis was undertaken, uh, public outreach was undertaken. We're well aware of the regional impacts associated with growth on different corridors. The people along Reno Road, uh, believe me, my heart goes out to them. Uh, uh, Chair, with regard to uh, empathy, I was involved in the community association long ago. Uh, I live in your riding chair and I empathize and understand what Strandher Drive means to my community is what new roads are also required coming to this community. That being said, the issue of the Blackburn Hamlet bypass, the roadway infrastructure that's proposed in terms of um, the route that if that's possible, uh, that, uh, can I share my screen? How do I do this? I cannot. No. I see you. Okay. In short, I have a, a picture of the alternate route that was being described that's debated with the NCC. A corridor is definitely needed further off to the east. This community is roughly two, two and a half kilometers from Reno Road. And Reno Road is suffering the upstream effects of traffic heading to this potential community. It's understood outright that a solution is needed. It's understood that the city has embarked upon a major environmental assessment study to determine a route to resolve this issue. And there are all sorts of regional plans that are currently being undertaken to address these issues and downstream effects on the community. Staff is aware of it, the consulting group was aware of it, and we've integrated the plans for the community with this infrastructure. The concerns that are raised are an issue of timing, the issue to bring infrastructure into the fold. Plans have been put forth with regard to how this would be serviced. Further off to the west of the community to be able to accommodate that demand. And whether it be through new roadways, additional lanes, enhanced transit improvements, all of these plans have to come together in order to allow this to develop over time. So it has been looked at. It's an old problem. Infrastructure will be put in place and the community will be able to form an integral part with the existing developments that current or currently are there. Uh, if you have any other further questions with regard to some of the documents that we've looked at, my goodness, it was everything from the city cycling plan, the pedestrian plan. You must be speaking from Barhaven. <laughs> in, in short, a, a lot of effort has gone into this. Uh, the community as a whole, uh, I think, has been planned and designed for the overall integration with pedestrian pathways, transit. Uh, it integrates well with all of the plans that are put forward. Now I believe the concept is, if we are happy with the plan, how does that integrate with the future? How we make this happen? And that's the challenge for all of us. Thank you, sir. Another question, Councillor Kitts? No, thank you very much for that response. I did have other questions uh, with respect to the affordable network and timeline, but I think that you've, you've satisfied them. Um, so, so, you know, I, I don't want to diminish the great work that's been done. I think that, you know, as, as you heard Ms. Buchanan say as well, the, the plan is en enviable. It's a good plan. I think it's just contingent for the success of the plan to have, you know, the appropriate transportation infrastructure in place. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Chair. But, you know, again, it's great that you point that out because, uh, um, and she, well, you know, we do these massive community design plans for all of our growth areas. We just updated, I think, the Riverside South one in the last year, maybe. Um, but definitely we've done the, the same uh, Fernbank um, design plan. Um, 
the bar the uh, bar haven community design plan and the south nepean community design plan that were um approved in 2006 both of them and uh you know i have uh, frank um um from you know one who reports to uh vivi um excellent guy but he always tells people that the Green Bank realignment that was to be constructed in 2016 is now going to be 2030 something. It's a real crowd pleaser, I'll tell you. But thank you. And then so all the more reason that's why I had Councillor uh, Tierney, who chairs transportation, speak. It's, yeah, you know, there, there's, um, it's tough not having that updated uh, TMP. Councillor Dupas, questions and then wrap up? Certainly. Um, I find it slightly ironic that we're, we're talking so much about the area around this, uh, this designated area uh, and the impacts on traffic. And I, I will get to that. But I do have questions about the EUP specifically. Um, I wanted to ask, I, I referenced in my questions to Mrs. Buchanan that uh, for and Casey Frank Bender, that is going to be an essential component to alleviating some of the traffic concerns and giving a connection from the south to the north and vice versa, as well as a transit corridor. I was hoping staff could speak a little bit about the timing, the prioritization of it, as well as the 40 kilometer speed limit that you're speaking about on that street, because Although you're making it a residential street, I fully anticipate that people will be using it as a main as a major artery to avoid heavier traffic on other arteries. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, the uh, uh, Fern Casey and uh, Frank Bender are, are both uh, are both uh, coll uh, collectors. Uh, they are intended to carry traffic from one area to another and to collect traffic through from local streets. Uh, both will have full connectivity with uh, cycle, tr um, cycle tracks, mops, and uh, and sidewalks. Uh, the intent, however, is to as to uh, for the urban design of this community is to really parallel the rest of the communities around it. It is a it is not a it's not intended to be a, uh, a thoroughfare arterial. Uh, this is uh, this is this area is intended to house uh, residences in a, in a, in a, in a safe fashion. I don't want to speak too much about uh, the, the 40 kilometer, uh, the 40 kilometer speed limit on a on a stretch. I think over a stretch like that, the difference between 40 and 50 kilometers is only going to be a few seconds. But they, as you know, that that does make a, a big difference in public safety. Uh, we've tried to make as much uh, much uh, connectivity uh, through uh, through the site with a fully connected grid so that uh, traffic can be. Uh, dis, uh, distributed throughout it that, that is within it. Uh, I do think, however, though, that the, uh, given the desire lines to, to get to Innis Road, uh, the, the few seconds it would take for folks to drive down Brian Coburn uh, through the roundabout and, uh, and up to Mayor Blur that would be the safest and most efficient uh, route. Uh, you know, and that we, I think a lot of other councillors deal with uh, through traffic, through residential neighborhoods. I don't think that anyone who wanted, wanted to start the principle of having a, uh, a very, uh, having a, a subdivision or a, a, a development area that, such as this, that's uh, torn in two by, uh, by a high-speed corridor. So we were reluctant to take that on in that way. Uh, I know that- uh, Sorry, Robin, I just know I have five minutes and everybody, there's okay. other questions. Oh, okay, so I'm picking it up. Timing priority? Uh, I can't speak to the timing priority of, uh, uh, Fern Casey, because uh, uh, the, the Fern Casey crossing is uh, developer driven. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, Ms. Wahab can uh, speak to uh, when Ridgecraft would do that. And uh, I believe the, uh, the southerly uh, uh, Frank Bender would be, uh, we've built much more early to service the uh, Glenview lands. Uh, are you able to speak to that uh, for us? Uh, as I said, at this point in time, we're going to be focusing on our phase two, three, and four lanes south of, south of the hydro corridor. So I don't have a timeline for the extension of Frank Casey up to Frank Bender. Um, so I'll just have to 
kind of come at a later date. So that, that component, that north-south connection will go a long way to providing, uh, whether it's 40 or 30, it still is going to be used predominantly by residents in the area. So just, I guess I'm flagging it for further conversation with staff and, and with the landowners group and Ridgecraft and that that will continue to be a priority. It will, uh, I would like to see that certainly prioritized before we start uh, putting in all the houses on the peripheries. So that's just a flag. I, I did want to note too, that I was very pleased to see that the mixed use area providing employment institutional residential would was being considered as a new hub in South Orleans, to kind of take away some of the pressures off of Innis. That hasn't always panned out in the past, in previous uh, incarnations of lands in this area, there's been employment designations or institutional and it's been reverted to residential. So Robin, can you just explain how that mixed use uh, zoning will prevail and what you foresee as that secondary hub in that community, in that area? Uh, certainly, uh, uh, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, the, uh, the lands just on the east side of Maribla have been employment and have been in an employment designation for quite some time. Uh, the original thinking behind it was that the bus rapid transit way in the station would would, uh, would create a, a, a fairly decent nexus for employment. The first employment uh, land use or the heavy industrial land use, uh, which we called a traditional industrial and freight in the new in the, in the draft new OP, is the snow da, is the snow disposal facility. Uh, those. Uh, that, that area does have a, a heavy industrial setback under the D6 guidelines around it. So we, it, it does foster more employment around it. Um, speaking, to, uh, uh, speaking towards the future, we, we will have a different relationship with employment. Office will no longer be considered an employment use. It's going to be uh, spread throughout the city and uh, you know, residential and an office can, can uh, coordinate together very well. And I'm sure that Mr. Miguelas can express, uh, explain the, the new OP in a great degree that way. Uh, there's certainly a lot of potential in that area and uh, what we see coming forward, uh, as you know, we can change the employment designation under the provincial policy statement through this, uh, through this process, but we can see some change uh, happening through our, new, uh, through our new OP and the new hub policies in there. I hope that answers your question. It does. Actually, you referenced the snow dump, and I did want to quickly just ask you about that. Is there a, a timeline for that being retired, grandfathered out, or is the intent is that will continue on um, as being adjacent to this community? Uh, there is no timeline for uh, to uh, to take that out. Um, I, know, I know they're sensitive about it in that in that uh, that section of the city. They like to call it a disposal, snow disposal facility. It's yeah. not. Um, uh, there, uh, there's a park next to it, and snow is not necessarily a contaminated thing, and so it's it's not it's not like a trail or anything like that. Um, we would like to see it uh, there. It, it plays an important function in the East End, in in snow clearing, and especially on those uh, local streets where they have to be collected. And I see I foresee it being there at least for another another few decades. And then my final question is: I have to say I, I was. Um, I was a little disappointed that there wasn't a little bit more emphasis given in the report itself. Although, and I have to say, Robin, you and I have had lengthy discussions about the impact of traffic and transit uh, needs in this area. I was a little disappointed it wasn't reflected in this report. The report does speak to the future uh, BRT. It speaks to the eventual extension uh, of Brian Colburn, but just in generalities, it speaks to potentially using arteries such as Innis for uh, bus lanes, which right now isn't conducive to that. I'm trying to understand, and I, I think I appreciated very much uh, Mr. Gordon's comments about how all this was taken into account. How can we ensure that, you know, when this is approved, uh, because I do support this plan, I think it's a wonderful plan, just the area around it that's got some issues. 
how can we ensure that in the TMP, those needs are going to be addressed, that we're prioritizing option seven, that we're prioritizing the improvements to the rural cross-section roads that are adjacent to this development, that we're prioritizing the Cumberland Transitway that has been sitting on the books and runs directly through this site. How can we make sure that infrastructure, transportation infrastructure keeps up with the building of homes? Uh, thanks, Councillor. That's a great question. And I, and I see uh, Alain Miguel is chomping at the bit to answer it. So well, let's let him. Where'd he go? There you are, Alain. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I think that's a really key question. And Mr. Uh, Gordon certainly provided a, a good overview of what they've studied when they looked at this community. And there's a couple of things here. One is, what is the big picture with respect to transportation? In other words, the folks that live here in this new neighborhood, where are they going? And there's two types of trips. There's long ones and short ones. For the short ones, there's a whole lot of work that we did that really um, uh, gives life to the work of the building better and smarter suburbs. Uh, all the projects that we've been doing through Chair Harder's leadership and, and through all the working groups. Uh, and you'll see the policies in the secondary plan that talk about connectivity. And of course, the other thing that, that's a big piece of this is the minimum density. There is a minimum density that applies to this, but actually what the developers of this neighborhood are, are putting forward is actually even higher than the minimum density. So right away, what you have is a very interconnected street system that lets people get places faster, whether they're driving, walking, taking the bus or, or whatever. So in terms of short trips, uh, definitely the Frank Casey shortcut is gonna be there for everybody, uh, but it's really gonna help for the people who actually live there because it can get to uh, Innes and to the stores quickly. This is suburban infill in a very big scale if you think about it. It's a piece of land that got completely surrounded and now we're adding 10,000 people to it. And th those 10,000 people are gonna add to the population of the general neighborhood. But the good thing about it is that they're already close to a lot of the things that they, they need in daily life. And we made sure that the street grid lets them get there in a variety of different ways so that they're not necessarily clogging the roads. And that's really a, a key piece of this that I think makes it different than an, uh, a new subdivision that is at the edge of the urban boundary. This is much more of in the middle of South Orleans. And I think you picked up on this, Councillor Dudas, quite well. We are reserving the lands that are around the station, uh, the stations of the Cumberland Transway for higher density. And we're going to keep talking. You'll, you'll notice there not, there's not a lot of direction in the secondary plan about the vicinity of those stations. The lands are just kind of there. We want to keep working with uh, the developers of those lands as the time comes for, uh, first of all, the neighborhood to build out so that there's a demand for nearby uh, shops and stores and offices. And the, the place for those will be at the transit station. So we're reserving the lands for when the day comes. And of course, we are uh, gonna be working with our colleagues in transportation on the transportation master plan uh, so that these long and short trips uh, are addressed. Uh, what Robin said earlier is true though, that there will be a shift in, in how people move around. Right now, people are driving to uh, through Renault and they're hitting those those gridlocks and those those pinch points because they're trying to get to a highway. If you're driving, you want a, a fast way into town, right? And so they're they're taking the 417 and they're joining the 417 at a place that flows. What's going to happen when uh, line one opens is that all of a sudden, if we're running buses up to the stations, well, that becomes a faster way into town. And at least it gives people a choice. Uh, Heather talked about, you know, this being a community that's, uh, you know, car dependent by design, but not by choice. That's what we want to do is to start to give choice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Alain. Informative as always. Um, so before I have uh, Councillor Leeper has questions, Councillor Dudas, before you go to your wrap up, I'm gonna to go to Councillor Leeper first, okay? Thank you. Councillor Leeper. Thanks. And it's just uh, some quick comments. I'm, I'm thinking very much about the debate that we had yesterday on, you know, creating a large new community, um, 445 hectares at the, uh, the Tewin lands. And we take a flyer on these subdivisions and we say that, you know, everything will work out. Um, and we're seeing here the transportation issues that are, you know, literally decades in the making in Barhaven, the transportation issues that are decades in the making. And the answer is always more roads. Uh, 
it seems as though we have a hard time building the roads that we say we need. Uh, and then even when the roads are built, uh, they don't solve the congestion issue because they induce more driving. Um, the and the the cost of maintaining those new roads falls to the taxpayer. Chair Harger, uh, you were talking about a, a thirty million dollar plus reconstruction of uh, of Main Street. That's that's reconstruction of of city assets that have to be done. It's it's not. $30 million worth of cycling infrastructure. That's reconstruction of city assets that have to be redone. I'm going to vote in favor of this plan today, because I think that the community design plan is, is a is a good looking plan. We continue to evolve how we think about suburbs. We're not approving development today. We are setting the direction of what that development needs to look like when it does move forward. But we have a real cautionary tale in our hands here as we uh, jump with both feet into urban boundary expansion about what the long-term effects are for the residents who have to live in neighborhoods that are unserved by uh, decent transit transit unserved by decent trans, uh, transportation infrastructure and where the cost of that new infrastructure falls on taxpayers right across the city. Um, I'll vote for it, but uh, you know, I think we should have yesterday's debate in mind as we, uh, as we move forward with the CDP. Good points, which is why yesterday at some point I brought up, would the rating have been, have benefited from being mobility? as opposed to just transit. Um, I think it would have. Certainly, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Barhaven and what I said, but the fact is without Strandherd, there is no sidewalk. There is no cycling lane. There are ditches. And 25,000 cars a day, probably more than that. I just haven't asked recently. Um, and that's why it's important too, getting the very fundamentals, fixing it. Well, that's a whole other star story that any of us could share, I'm sure, whether it's potholes or whatever, right? Um, okay, back to Councillor Dudas for wrap up. Wonderful, thank you, Chair. And I'll, I'll keep it short. I, I wanted to just start off by expressing my absolute gratitude to staff. Um, city staff have done a phenomenal job. This has been a very lengthy process, has seen multiple iterations um, and the work that they've put into it and in particularly Robin um, has done a phenomenal job. Uh, no pressure Robin by the way, now you got to deliver. Um, I think that the work that has been done uh, as well too with the landowners group, I think there's been a lot of interaction in that. So what we're seeing before us is actually a really good plan. I'm going to be supporting it. I think that the idea of it, the concepts of it is what we want to see. And I think it speaks volumes about when we create something new, it has opportunities, it lends itself to 15 minute communities where we're falling flat is everything around it. And that's the difficulty. The difficulty is we're looking at this new community and I will, and I said this a moment ago, I'm gonna be supporting this. I think it's wonderful and I'd love to see more of this type of forward thinking for our transportation networks, for our employment lands, for our mixed use, this is good stuff. But what I have concerns about is all the impacts it's gonna have on everything around it. How do we funnel? And we, we keep saying, you know, uh, 5,200 homes, but we're not, we're talking about almost 10,000 people. So if every person has a car and a half, and, and I'd love to say that people will have bikes, but once again, we don't have cycling infrastructure in the East End. We don't, we're pushing for it, but we're constantly buying and going to the same pot that everybody else is for money for cycling infrastructure. So we'll continue to press for that, but it's just not there yet. Transit infrastructure, we're going to see improvements, of course, when LRT launches in 2024. That's gonna be a huge game changer, but that's gonna do a lot for the east-west connection. It's, it's not gonna do much for our north-south and it won't do anything for South Orleans. So we're still continuing to see these pressures. So I, I really wanted to, to point to the fact that, you know, we're not, it, this, this plan itself and what we're approving today, and I would encourage my colleagues to approve it, it's out of, it's in the context of the greater conversation that as, as Chair Harder said, we're, kind, we're all facing. The unusual aspect about this community is one, we're banded by a green belt. So we have no room to move through it without the uh, appreciation and, and approval of the MCC. 
And two, we're not just fixing old roads. We're playing catch up. We are literally looking at rural roads that were never meant to be used for the high traffic and volume that it currently exists, let alone these almost 10,000 vehicles on our roads. So, you know, I would say this is a really good step in the right direction. I look forward to seeing how this one will unfold. And I am approving it based on the fact that we have, you know, in the report says 2036, we have maybe 2041 before we start to see the development actually finish and complete. So we have time to work on it but we need to prioritize transportation infrastructure at the same time or even before we're putting in our homes. And I know it's hard under the current uh, development charges uh, processes, I get that, but we cannot be playing catch up all the time or otherwise we cannot say yes to residential development on mass. So once again, thank you staff, amazing work, phenomenal. I can't wait to see this continue in the process. I want to thank uh, my colleague, Councillor Kitts, for bringing forward a lot of these key um, uh, items. And uh, I would encourage everyone to vote for this. And uh, thank you for the lengthy conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillors uh, Dudas and Councillors Kitts. And yes, to uh, Robin um, and, uh, of course, Don Herwire and his entire team, Ella Megalis, I'm looking. Thanks, uh, thanks to everyone who participated in the conversation today. Um, so we're asking that for approval of the East Urban Community Phase Three area and all the work that went into that, whether it's the master servicing, the master transportation, the parks, the environmental assessment, um, et cetera. On the item, uh, let's see, do I have a motion? Yes, I do. So the, we've already had this introduced. It's the uh, technical amendment um, that uh, Vice Chair Gower moved. Is that carried? Carried. carried. And on the report as amended, carried? Carried. carried. Thank you. So I have a question for you all. Um, the next item is going to be, I think um, we're having, well, I know we're having a presentation we have one, two, three, we have uh, four speakers. Um, and then we have, then we have item seven that we're holding. And that one is uh, also in Councillor Leeper's work, bonus day for Councillor Leeper. And then we have um, Preston Street development charge complaint being held. And then our last item, which is the Andrew Fleck uh, home on uh, Laurier. So normally at 12.30, we would be taking uh, a break or going through. I think uh, after the conversation we've just had now, would you agree that, and, and we don't need to, call, to, um, to stop for half an hour. How about we take 10 minutes right now? Is that long enough or do you want 15? Good, 10 minutes. I'm looking at Council Brockington because, so it's 11.43. So why don't we come back at noon? We'll take a little bit longer than that, okay? I'll see you at noon, everybody. Take a break. <laughs>